welcome everybody. Does everybody have their drink? It's all settled. Um, hey, welcome. My name is Tracy Luke. I am an associate professor at the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication at Iowa State University. And I'm very happy to be here today and very honored to be uh, sharing a panel with the panelists to my left who are all extremely accomplished in bringing a really interesting mix of perspectives to the conversation. Um, I want to thank Katie Kohler and Krista Eastman for the opportunity to be here. Um, and as Katie said, the focus of our panel discussion will be on representations. There is a quotation from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz that I, I read years ago and I've always just really appreciated it. He defines culture as the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And so this panel's focus is on those stories. And as we were talking and, and coming up with um, you know, a, a direction uh, for the discussion, I was thinking about how when you look at representations and, and the stories, um, there are a couple ways to approach it. And one is to look at the practices and the values and the influences culturally, organizationally, that influence the way certain stories get told. And then on the other hand, you can look at the impact of those stories both on audiences and um, kind of in a larger historical and cultural way. And so I'm hoping to start us off with some questions that will touch on both of those areas. Um, but I also hope that you all will feel comfortable asking questions as well, because I would really like for this to be a conversation that includes lots of voices. So I'll start by introducing our panelists and then get us started with sort of a broad positioning type of question and we'll take it from there. Um, to, to my left is Barbara Blitzstein, who is a public health nurse and health reporter. She produces and hosts Health Cetera podcast that provides evidence-based health news, analysis, and commentary. You can find her on Twitter at the Blitzstein. Um, she was also a co-investigator of the Woodhull Study Revisited, which was published in May of 2018. That was a replication of research from 20 years earlier that examined the representation of nurses as sources and photo subjects in health news stories, and looked at what journalists considered to be both barriers and facilitators to their using nurses as stories as sources in their stories. Um, she is a, an advocate for a greater diversity in health reporting. Um, next to her left is Kim Knapp-Sawyer, who is a contributing editor at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, a nonprofit organization that supports reporting on global issues such as climate change, refugees and migrants, peace and conflict, and public health. Kem directs a student fellowship program that provides grants to university students to do international reporting projects. And she has reported on children at risk in Congo, Haiti, Bangladesh, and India. Kem was in the third class of women at Yale University, which is uh, salient for our discussion today. Before joining the Pulitzer Center, she taught writing at the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C. Next is Dr. Linda Steiner, who is a professor in the College of Journalism at the University of Maryland and the editor of Journalism and Communication Monographs. She has published more than 100 book chapters and refereed journal articles, including about sexual harassment in journalism and journalism education. Her recent co-edited books include The Handbook of Gender and War, Race, News, and the City, Uncovering Baltimore, and journalism, gender, and power. She worked for a small newspaper before earning her PhD at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Linda also leads the campus Keeping Our Faculty program at the University of Maryland. Next is Nagasi Tesla Michael, who is the K-12 education reporter at the Capital Times in Madison, primarily covering the Madison Metropolitan School District the second largest in Wisconsin. He's a 2018 graduate of UW-Madison and majored in English and political science. 
and he served as the managing editor of the Daily Cardinal. He previously was a digital intern at WISC TV, channel3000.com, in 2018, and a breaking news and politics intern at Politico in 2017. So, welcome to you all. I wondered if we could start with each of you talking a bit about what the Me Too movement means to you in terms of your fields and where you are in your careers. Maybe we can start with Barbara and we're probably done. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Time's Up in Healthcare just got launched this year, and we are 80% of healthcare workers are women. And what we know across healthcare workers in, uh, who are women, starting with housekeeping or at the top at housekeeping, nursing attendants, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, etc., is that in that 80 percent there are continuous and repeated assaults on sexual harassment and uh, harassment in general at work. I also want to let you know, if you don't know, that 13 percent of nurses are men. However, as recent as this year, studies continue to show that on average, holding for years of education, certification, hours, and position, men make $6,000 more a year than women nurses in the same exact jobs and positions. So we have a lot of work to do on equal pay, on sexual harassment, on representation, and on issues of addressing power and authority of women in the healthcare field. My interest in the Woodhull study um, resulted in being a health reporter and being a public health nurse for over 35 years, where I have been a media analyst and media strategist trying to see who are we talking about in journalism and what stories are being covered. And journalism is about democracy and hearing voices that represent all people. And people are missing in the health reporting space that represent women and people of color, people of different genders and identity. So the Me Too movement and the Times Up Healthcare is connected with the uh, overall Times Up movement. Uh, there's a legal defense fund budget for those who are facing those disparities, as well as who have been unsuccessful or are successful currently in uh, pursuing uh, against these harassments at work. Um, I was at the launch of that at the New York Academy of Medicine. It is a cross-section of women uh, in those positions that I mentioned, and I think it's trying to also diversify even further, recognizing that in healthcare in general, medicine is the power authority, and that in order for us to be successful in this movement, we need to level the playing field and see ourselves as equals facing these issues. Um, it's really about women uh, feeling safe at work. I think uh, Kara mentioned that. Uh, women don't feel safe in addition to increasing violence, not only from patients, which is also reported on the rise in the healthcare field. We also have the issue of whether or not we can show up at work as dignified equals. And we do also know there's data that supports that these environments are impacting patient care. So it's not only that we are facing these issues for ourselves, but we really know the quality of patient care is absolutely directly related to these environments. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, as Tracy said, uh, we give grants to journalists uh, to do international reporting projects at the Pulitzer Center. And we are a relatively small staff. We have 20 members. And we've not yet had to deal with issues of harassment. But I think the Me Too movement has influenced us in other ways. I think it's made the team much more conscious of making sure we give grants to as many women as we do men now more involved in counting numbers. And we have a staff member who has sort of taken this on. This is our uh, person in charge of marketing. And so she's been keeping very close records. We did have records before, but now we're looking at them more on a monthly basis. And sure that you know, we distribute grants, um, not only in terms of gender, but also thinking about issues of diversity and inclusivity. And right now, we 
looked in 2018, we gave 52% to men and 48% to women. So we're you know, trying to make those numbers uh, look better. Uh, we also work with student fellows, and that's something I'm very involved in. I have found that with students from our partner universities, we have 35 partner universities, liberal arts colleges, community colleges, uh, journalism schools, schools of public health, historically black colleges and universities. And we give grants to students there who are emerging journalists. Some of them may not end up going into journalism. They may want to work for nonprofits or in their national fields. It's interesting that in for the past several years, we've had more female applicants than male applicants, and we've had more female student fellows than male student fellows. And it's not like we've consciously tried to do that. I think it's a result of the interest in the applications. Uh, so, but with the grants to professional journalists, yeah, we see a difference, and so that's something we're really trying to work on. Well, I will talk about this in terms of my research. That's what uh, researchers do. Um, so let me begin to answer this question from Tracy about what um, the Me Too movement um, meant to me in terms of my research by noting that um, in the, um, about 1990, I published a uh, research article about my analysis of 75 memoirs by women journalists on um, book length memoirs that went back to the uh, 1890s when women started writing books about their careers. One thing that really stuck, uh, stood out in my mind was that for all the variety in their experiences, not one woman in her autobiography or memoir failed to mention some sexual harassment. Um, but again, this was kind of a historical piece of work. And um, in, uh, then in the 1990s, I stopped seeing references to this. And um, I'll, I'll also note that I did some research on the uh, reporting of the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings when he was being considered for Supreme Court, um, and you know how that turned out. One of the things that stood out for me is that in the reporting about Anita Hill's claims about sexual harassment, journalists, almost every one of them, um, including women who were writing about this, discussed sexual harassment is something that happened to other people, but not to journalists. And since by then I was out of the newsroom, I kind of thought, how naive was I, that this didn't happen to journalists anymore, or at least it didn't happen in a way that really made women journalists uh, highly uncomfortable, that, that it was something that they would agonize over. Um, so, uh, I have to say that um, uh, one of the things that really struck me about the reporting of the Me Too movement was about the number of women who describe their own experiences in contemporary newsrooms, not just going back 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago for that matter but that happened recently of sexual harassment. And it really brought home um, how this is a continuing issue for uh, journalism. Again, I, I, I'm astounded at my own na naivete about uh, journalism and, and about newsrooms on this. Again, uh, part of it was I was out of the newsroom 
and I was in a university setting, and so then I realized, okay, well, it's going on at universities. That's why I actually switched um, to the wonderful University of Maryland, where Tracy got her PhD. Um, but um, uh, so we are not exempt as journalists from um, this uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited and uh, nervous to be here. Um, I, I want to focus a little bit on the second part of the question about um, how the MeToo movement um, means to me with, in terms of where I am in my career. I'm obviously very early in my career, uh, that I graduated less than a year ago from college. Um, and, and I think one thing that's really important to, to consider is that you know, the MeToo movement, while it's started more recently isn't something that should necessarily be other as just this movement that we talked about on a certain day or something, and that it's something that should be pervasive in how we educate journalists and how we how we young journalists um, shape their careers uh, going forward, and it shouldn't be um, something that is just, oh, that's something that we, we address in one space, but it, or that certain people have to address, and that it's, um, that we all have to Make more conscious efforts to <coughs> include more uh, more active, more active steps to, to add sexual harassment and sexual assault in newsrooms and journalism and, and in our our reporting as well. It's, it's something that I really uh, have, have noticed and have something that I continuously try to strive to do in my reporting, but I'll also know that I also I need to step back and reassess a lot, especially. Um, as someone who doesn't necessarily have a lot of experience yet in my career, but also, and also, um, just my um, experience of being a man in a, in, a, in a newsroom, and knowing that there are certain things that I am not able to necessarily relate to, but I, that doesn't mean that I should be some sort of bystander in newsrooms, and that I should still play a more active role in being able to be an advocate for others. That's great. Um, so I'm curious. Um, you know, I, I recently did a search in Access World News and found that in the past couple of years, about 22,000 news articles published around the world contained the hashtag MeToo, either in the lead of the story or in the first paragraph of the story. Given um, your perspectives and your backgrounds, have you been surprised? by the sheer volume of these stories or the nature of some of these stories that are coming out? I'll jump in. I don't think I'm surprised anymore. What I'm surprised about is when people are surprised, uh, <laughs> to be very frank. I, even in my own home, uh, speaking in my own circle of family and friends, it's not that I'm like, oh gee, another story about this, but it is almost, oh gee, another story about this. Um, Kara said, told to share the story about going to the backyard and looking for something and wondering if someone was lurking behind the fence. I have my laundry room story and constantly putting a note up to my neighbors, please lock the laundry room door when you're finished. I don't like opening it and wondering if someone's lurking inside. And as a 65-year-old feminist woman, um, I've grown up this way. And I wish I could shake it, and it's not like it's the front of my cerebral cortex, but it's lurking all the time. And the fact that we are talking about it, um, I've shared some instances with my own husband that I never shared before as this Me Too movement became more public. So it's helped me reveal instances as a child, um, instances in my work environment that I've kind of held in my spine and learned how to use body language differently and walk down the street in Manhattan with a certain attitude. And I am no longer surprised. I'm very, um, I'm really glad they're coming out. And I think that there are allies and I want to just acknowledge what Nagasi said that um, there are male allies uh, who are beginning to um, recognize that that pat on the shoulder at work is unwelcomed, that um, physical consent is something we teach now our children and our grandchildren, 
I never encouraged my kids to be kissed or hugged by anyone growing up. It was their choice, whether it was a family member or a friend. And I think that is a lesson that is part of what the cultural shift will demand, that bodily agency is a man and a woman's right and identified, however you identify gender-wise, that that's your right. And these stories are helping to tip slightly, I won't be overly optimistic, recognizing that um, these behaviors, including what's going on with this, the 19th or 20th Democratic uh, uh, nominee, Joe Biden, he's, you know, he, we all saw it, you know, Anita Hill was written about in the New York Times today that um, he has not yet really fully apologized and still realize that this is that's old Joe and keep hearing those stories and changing behavior. Um, Michael Steinhardt in the Jewish philanthropy community as someone who works in that world, it's not okay. Um, so these stories and all this news reporting on it worldwide is the beginning of a shift and I'm glad they're being reported, but no, I'm not surprised. I can add something uh, to this, speaking more <coughs> globally, because at the Pulitzer Center, we focus mostly on global stories. I think we have seen an increase in applications for grants to cover stories related to domestic violence or to modern slavery, whether it's dowry violence in India or domestic violence in Guyana, uh, modern slavery in Ethiopia. We have uh, a journalist now focused on Ethiopian women who've been trafficked and then returned to their country and are experiencing mental, mental trauma. So many more applications about domestic abuse and sexual violence and also many more grants that we're getting. And this is something we're seeing. I have to say that in, in some sense, I was a little surprised by um, the sheer volume. Right from the beginning, I became obsessed with this story, and I decided, well, I would keep a file of all of the, the stories about um, uh, sexual harassment and Me Too. And so first, I just started with the New York Times and the New Yorker stories. and created a file just on Weinstein and then one on Hollywood, but then I created a file on stories from various professions, and then I realized this is getting out of hand, so I had to subdivide it into a file on uh, law, and then I had to subdivide that to lawyers and judges, and then another one for the tech industry, and another one for journalism. Then I had to divide the journalism one into international stories and journalism. So now I have maybe 50 files, each with a thousand stories in them. Um, but but the, the reason I am a little surprised is because it was very clear right from the beginning, clear from um, a lot of other work and, and from my own experience working with rape victims, um, is that it not only has been, but I think it still continues to be uh, a really agonizing event for women to go public with their own accounts of sexual harassment and uh, sexual violence. Um, there is something about that invasion of one's body that makes talking about it extremely Troubling, even if we think we're tough and who cares, and you know, we're not a virgin anymore, so you know, what's the big deal? Um, Asia Argento told um, a Roman pharaoh after she agreed to have her name be um, linked with her story in the New Yorker that she went home and she threw up. Um, and, and she said, what have I fucking done with my life now that I you know, told him this? And um, so on one hand, um, the, the sheer number of women who have uh, said, you know what, I want to tell my story, and even I want to tell my story in being named, I think 
is a little surprising. On the other hand, the fact that so many women are doing it has shifted um, the way this uh, happened. So it, it became a real pivot point. So now I think the fact that so many women uh, have done this and seem to be uh, gratified by the impact that it's had certainly encourages other women to come forth, as well as men to come forth, uh, and transgender people, and people of other gender and sexual minorities to come forth and explain how they've been harassed or sexually violated. And um, so at this point, I think the body certainly makes a lot of sense. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I guess I don't have too much to add, but I would say that I also agree that I'm not necessarily, that I'm more surprised when people are surprised. Uh, but I also think I, within terms of like the sheer volume of news articles that have uh, this in the lead, I do sometimes worry that we'll reach some sort of plateau at some point, and especially um, last year with like, the Kavanaugh hearings. I think that sort of maybe it is the more partisan realm where in, when like these issues should not be partisan issues, so that it is something that sometimes worries me that we'll sort of reach some sort of plateau in terms of uh, the sheer volume that we've seen over the past few years. I just want to add a story because you mentioned Brett Kavanaugh. And Brett Kavanaugh worked for Kenneth Starr during the Clinton uh, trials, and uh, I, last couple of weeks ago, I met Monica Lewinsky, who spoke about her current, um, really have come out after 20-something years and become public. And she talks about, if you haven't listened to or watched her TED Talk, it's worth watching. Her first opening question is, how many of you in the room did something at 20, never did anything at the age 22 that you wished you didn't do? And then she said, I made a really big mistake. I fell in love with the most powerful man in the world. And um, it was before the internet, and she, her life was really destroyed. And she really uh, has, I would say, post-traumatic stress syndrome as a, without the right to diagnose her. Um, so I apologize, Monica. But um, she spoke about the difference between, and how she came out now because of the Me Too movement. And um, I went back and looked at some of the articles about Kavanaugh during that time. He was advising Starr on the cross testimony. And he had a memo with some of the most graphic questions that he wanted asked during the testimony that were not asked, but the memo was leaked. And it's quite um, disturbing all around that he's on the Supreme Court and what we saw during his nomination proceedings in terms of women coming forward and not being believed. So I think we can talk about the Me Too movement without the internet, and now what's happened since the internet. And the question is, are 22,000 uh, reported stories globally representative of more than 22,000 women and perhaps men, but what does that compare to the population of women globally? So this raises, um, I think, a really important question that also came up um, in the talk with Kara Swisher earlier, and she talked about wanting to put a face um, to one of these stories, but also the difficulty in doing that. And I'm wondering, um, what do you see as the ethical considerations that journalists need to take into account when reporting on stories regarding sexual harassment and violence? I, I think uh, we have to be careful about uh, naming, naming people. And again, because most of my experience has been global reporting, uh, when we have journalists who go out and interview people in other countries <laughs> who you know, have suffered from rape or sexual harassment, um, we want to make sure that if they tell our stories, do they want their names used? And I think that 10 years ago, it was very hard in some major media outlets to get a story published unless the person was willing you know, to give their name or his name. That has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. And you will more often see quotes and the last name may be omitted and there's an explanation 
um, that the last name is not being used to protect the person's privacy. And I think that we need to make sure that journalists know when they you know, go and seek these stories that they do no harm. So if people are willing to open up, um, that they know what this means. And I'm talking more about people in um, communities where they may not be used to reading you know, a newspaper every day. They may not know that what they say is going to be on the internet and read all over the world. So I just think it's very important that when um, you know, we're talking to indigenous groups in Asia or Africa about subjects like to, you know, domestic violence, um, that you know, they're aware of the implications of their stories. It's very important to tell the stories, but you know, they need to know that they can protect their identity. And we've had um, reporters go into the Philippines to talk about the uh, after effects of Duterte's drug wars. And we've been very careful, you know, not to use names or in video, not to show the face or to blur the face. And I think that as editors, you know, we have to be very careful about that. But we need to have them tell their stories because it's important if um, we want to see change. I certainly agree. I, I, I would add that, um, yeah, I think there's been somewhat of a pivot point so that journalists understand that um, if they can supplement their stories with as was certainly the case in the Tui Cantor story in the New York Times and the <coughs> Farrow story in the New Yorker and subsequent stories, supplemented with court documents, uh, internal memos, emails, uh, testimonies from multiple women, uh, interviews with friends and co-workers and family and including spouses and children of people who have been sexually harassed or sexually violated. Um, that goes a long way to substantiating stories so that um, sometimes names are, are not the point. And the point is um, the numbers of women who have experienced uh, very specific patterns of sexual harassment in a particular uh, work domain, like the hotel industry, the taxi cab industry, um, uh, the telephone uh, construction whole, you know, technology industry, um, newsrooms, again, to take that example. Um, so it's not always about the individual uh, experiences of one woman. Um, I do think that there are some ethical quandaries that we haven't quite worked out as journalists. Um, one has to do with um, sort of lists that might be somewhat unvetted that just get posted. I don't know how many of you know about the so-called um, shitty media men list that was on the internet for about 12 hours. I think um, in that particular case, there was a little bit of vetting of names. And before that um, uh, list was taken down, it was only up on the internet for about 12 hours. And then only to certain people before it was um, taken down that some newsrooms saw that men uh, from their own organizations were on the list, investigated, and found that the allegations were, um, were well-founded or were, were documented and did something about it. Uh, but um, that, that was a little crazy-making, I think, that, that that list could just get posted and, and then be shared without there being um, kind of shoe leather reporting that good journalists do. Um, but what I do think is that um, 
for the volume of Me Too stories really finally made it clear why women not only would not want their names uh, in the news media, but also would go for a long, long time without telling anybody, and certainly without making an official report. When some of those early stories came out, say with um, Judge Roy Moore, who was up for an election, uh, and the Washington Post talked to several women, uh, including very young women uh, in their teens, uh, early teens, that he had um, uh, harassed and, and probably molested. Um, there was this notion that, oh, they're just trying to do some last minute electioneering to do his uh, campaign. And other women were saying, are you kidding? Someone would just make up an allegation? Just No one would do that. No one is going to make up these stories. Um, but that's different from saying you should have some stained uh, investigation to check out the first few things. I think one thing that I would add is uh, it's sort of from I was at the Daily Cardinal and we had a special edition that was focused on sexual assault at UW Madison. And one of the editorial decisions we made was to um, describe those who have experienced harassment or sexual assault as survivors and not victims. And it's, I think it was the right decision because it's important to use affirming language when we are uh, writing, writing in stories about uh, these traumatic experiences. Of, uh, I just want to add, I attended the McCormick Foundation's workshop on reporting on uh, people who have been trafficked. And I think there are some uh, similar pieces of advice that I've learned. One is, don't be a voyeuristic journalist. Um, be careful about how much you're asking because you're very curious about the details. And whether that's going to wind up in the story or as part of your own voyeurism. Uh, check in on your own values before you even meet with people um, when you're going to be reporting on these kinds of um, harassment, sexual, gender violence issues. And of course, if we can talk with other people that we know who have experienced this, they are our best teachers of what feels right to be asked during an interview and what doesn't feel right to be asked. And at this McCormick Foundation uh, uh, workshop that I went to, they actually invited uh, three women, young women, who had um, been able to get out of the trafficking situation. And they described being horribly harassed by journalists in the past and that they would not be interviewed again because of these issues of the detailed interests of what actually happened, which never wound up in the story and had nothing to do with what they were currently doing. How are you living now, perhaps, might be a good question, having gone through this experience. And what have you done um, to, to heal that experience that makes you a stronger survivor today? Can I just add, add a footnote to that? I, I think um, Barbara's raising a really important point, and it has to do, uh, again, with what Barbara emphasized, how the interview feels what experience this um, feel and what, what they want to talk about. Um, but there is also a separate dilemma about what details uh, go into the story. So someone may describe in some detail, because she really wants to explain it um, as uh, agonizing as it may be to describe it, what happened, what she saw, <laughs> what it felt like at the time. And then there's, but does that mean we do actually put all of those details um, into um, the, the broadcast or the published or the posted story? And I have to say, personally, I thought it was good to have those details. I wanted to know about Charlie Rose parading around in his um, uh, open 
quite fast for over its you know, fifth quarter. Um, I, I thought it was important to be clear about that so that there would be no mistake. Um, but I could understand that some people might think that that was just titillating and the point of these stories is not to titillate. Um, it, it's a totally different kind of exposure that we're talking about. Uh, speaking to the McCormick uh, emphasis on focusing on healing, uh, we have a new project. Uh, a journalist wants to cover sexual trafficking in the U.S., uh, mostly immigrants from other countries, which is going to focus on, uh, I think, Miami, New York, and California. But instead of only focusing on those who've experienced sexual trafficking, she's going to be talking about the healthcare system in the US and how is the US healthcare system dealing with this, not only in hospitals and clinics, but in medical schools. And there needs to be more reform in uh, people who have experienced sexual um, harassment and trafficking. Nagasi, I have a question um, specifically for you, and that is as somebody who is a relatively new reporter, I'm thinking back to when I graduated from college and took my first beat reporting job. I'm not sure that I ever would have gone into it expecting to potentially have to report on one of these stories. And I'm wondering, as the education reporter, is that on your radar? Do you think at some point, gosh, I could see somebody, you know, accusing of and a principal, an administrator, I mean, are you thinking about that and do you feel prepared for a story like that? Yeah, I, I think, um, to the first question, I think I would not be surprised if I had to report on that, um, especially uh, given the opportunity to talk earlier about the sheer volume of stories uh, that are being published and uh, uh, feeling more confident in sharing their story. I, I think that. I, so in that sense, I would not be surprised if I had to. I think I do sometimes worry that I might not be as prepared as I could be, and I think that's a constant process of trying to uh, look to see what best practices are, to, especially I think on the education beat, given um, a lot of the sort of privacy issues with FERPA and something that I think education boards across the board have to sort of deal with, and I think that sort of adds another dimension to how how education writers about sexual assault, whether it's at the K-12 uh, level or at the higher ed. Um, Linda, from the perspective of a professor, um, what can we be doing to prepare our journalism students um, to do this kind of reporting and to go into workplaces where this might happen? Well, let me first say that uh, besides the question of what can we do to prepare, the first thing is to know that we do have to prepare students mm -hmm. to do that. And um, I, I'm happy to hear that uh, Madasi uh, does feel prepared because I don't think that reading the stories that has published um, explains what might be necessary for a reporter to know before going into a situation to uh, interview people who have experienced those. That, that doesn't necessarily get written into the story. How do you um, establish um, a, an attitude of caring and empathy and give people a, enough time and space to answer your questions and let the process go on for a long time. I, again, some of these stories might take um, a year to develop before they're ready for publication. So um, I, I do think we need to have units in our courses. Um, it's not the kind of thing that we usually think of as being included in a investigative journalism class, how do you uh, track down um, these stories? How do you actually get the perpetrators um, and their defenders to, to talk to you as a reporter? So uh, 
I, I do think we need to really be very upfront uh, about this and to include it as units in, in classes and also the ethics of doing that. Um, and then there is also the question, uh, which I'm hoping Nancy has not himself had to um, uh, be prepared for, but, but still, I think we do need to prepare our, uh, our students for what they're going to do when they are sexually harassed or they see someone else being sexually harassed in, uh, in the newsroom. And my, my huge file on, on newsroom sexual harassment in, in, um, includes stories, for example, about a guy who saw, uh, although he knew that the other parties didn't know that he was in the room, but he, or that he could see what was going on, he saw the publisher of um, the Amazon Star, it turns out, uh, spanking a woman with a metal ruler um, uh, and, and actually hurting her quite badly. Um, and, and never said anything to her and certainly never said anything to the public. So we need to be preparing our students and at a time when um, journalism is a a uh, tough field and people are having trouble um, surviving on what they can earn as journalists, um, but, uh, or having any jobs in the first place. I hate to be discouraging and I hate to be uh, saying, um, you know, there's some bad things that happen in, in newsrooms, um, but I do feel that it's really important for um, for me as a journalism educator, for my colleagues to not only prepare students um, to do these kinds of stories um, and to stand up for their own bodies and for those of their colleagues in the newsroom, but also uh, I think we need to be very aggressive as journalism educators when we <coughs> Uh, sense and certainly when we know that, for example, intern supervisors are uh, sexually harassing interns. Um, we need to help the students deal with sexual harassment. And I think that interns, by the way, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, but, but also we need to tell those uh, newsrooms that are recruiting our students on campus, that they can't come to campus, that we can tell in the 70s as we did, and subsequently WOTC organizations that they can't recruit on our campuses because we didn't like what they were doing. Um, we should tell newsrooms, we're, we're not going to let our um, our students take jobs there because that's how they're treating uh, young workers. Okay, I have one more question that I, I want to ask before I um, turn things over to the audience. And that is because you all have expressed an interest in diversifying um, the sources and the types of stories that get told. Um, and I think it's important to note that the Me Too movement, what we call the Me Too movement, gained a lot of momentum um, in 2017 with a tweet from Alyssa Milano um, amid accusations against Harvey Weinstein and others in Hollywood. However, Tarana Burke, an African American woman, had actually coined the phrase and started the movement about 10 years earlier. And I'm wondering what you think that says about how journalists and our larger culture respond to the experiences of white women versus women of color. I, I can start. Um, I, there is an organization called Women's Photograph, which tracks the number of women photographers whose photographs appear on A1 and the front page of the newspapers. And they are comparing New York Times, Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, and Wall Street Journal. I recommend all of you to check 
this out. Uh, they also tweak the numbers weekly. And has anybody looked at this? So I, I can just tell you that, first of all, women, as you might expect, are in general underrepresented in, but that major news media is aware of this and trying to change it. In 2018, the New York Times had 19.9% photographs on A1 by women. In the first three months of 2019, that number has risen to 30%. And the Times now has, I think, weekly meetings with their photo editors where they announce these numbers. So if they see that they're slipping, you know, they try to make amends the following week. So they're very now aware of this. San Francisco Chronicle, it's interesting, has better numbers than some of the other newspapers. Uh, 2018, they were 40.8%, and in the first three months of 2019, they're now 44%. But that does not speak to your question of women of color and diversity. Oh, another resource? Okay, diversify. Okay, so. Diversify photo, everybody here. So Women's Photograph is also doing women of color. And the numbers there are pretty appalling. 2018, 4.8% in the New York Times, 0.8% in the Guardian and the Wall Street Journal. These are photos appearing on A1 by women of color. So I also think um, we need to have much more emphasis uh, of assigning stories to local storytellers. So if we're going to go off and write a story about what's happening in India, look for journalists in India to tell that story. Look for journalists in Brazil. Tell stories about the rainforest. Uh, I, think, I think all of that would happen. I would just say we all have to check our biases. And um, it's an ongoing daily reflection that will hopefully create a more diverse source, a more diverse photograph, and editors will pick it up fast if a journalist has only talked to white men or white women and not people of color, uh, whether it's Hispanic, um, black, or Asian uh, sources. Um, this is, journalism speaks to democracy. Our demographics in this country are shifting dramatically. If you are covering uh, the current uh, very newsworthy number of deaths in America of black women giving birth, speak to some of the, uh, cite black women, go to Black Mamas Matter, stop interviewing white oncologists and obstetricians who live in urban centers. I mean, there's, it's not rocket science. I think it's taking our blinders off and recognizing that we are not doing a great job <coughs> representing this country and representing the amount of expertise and scholarship across both gender, race, and ethnicity, and identity. And I think we have to just pause, <coughs> take a very serious look at ourselves, and recognize that we have been mainly reporting on people who might look like me, including myself. So I am um, not, not there, and I won't be there probably ever. I was raised in the 50s, and I'm aware of some of my internalized biases, and I'm working hard at it, and I have to own it. <laughs> sometimes keep my mouth shut so somebody else and I can pass the mic for them to speak for themselves. We don't empower people, we make the space for people who know what they need and what they want to talk about to say it. We just have to create that space and move over. I, I want to add something about interns since you brought up interns in terms of uh, diversifying newsrooms with interns who are speaking not only of gender, race, and ethnicity, but economic diversity. And I think in order to find economic diversity, we have to pay our interns, or we're only going to get interns. <laughs> so supported by their family. And there have been newspaper stories from, from Washington, 
what's happening in DC. So Washington Post has you know, published surveys of interns in Washington. There are more young people in Washington. Just about in the city, they come here for internships. And you know, you look at who becomes an intern, and it's somebody whose family can supplement their income. Um, I think on the topic of interns, I obviously I agree with what is said. It's also really important that when diversifying intern classes and like in general, that we have support systems for those people. Um, I think it's very easy for newsrooms to sort of use people from marginalized groups as like a token to be like, oh, look, we have like one black reporter, we have some diversity and like and it's and it's good that like people are talking about it now and people are looking to have diverse staffs but I think it's also important to make sure that there are support systems for them in place so that they feel welcome and they feel more included. Um, I think back to like the uh, the original question I think it's really important to have for reporters nowadays to audit audit their sources and sort of think about, okay, like, who am I quoting, who am I reaching out to, and I think we also need to get away from this idea that um, we only have to look at, like, certain authoritative sources. I think a lot of times, for my being, especially, I kind of, it's easy to sort of get, well, I'll just, you know, talk to some school board members, and, and that's it, and, and I should, you know, or, and I should be, I, I should be doing a lot more to get out into the community and talking to parents who might not necessarily get a chance to go to school board meetings all the time or might not have the, the resources or luxury to be able to um, do a lot of that those other forms of advocacy that usually um, are done by people who have a lot of privilege and you know, it, it, it's, they have the resources to do that. Okay, we have time for some questions. I'm Joy Orvick of the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. Institutions such as the one we're in right now have uh, rape statistics, they've got security statistics, and they often play these statistics as if it's a marketing game. Uh, releasing them at certain times, like right before uh, uh, holidays, we've had interesting releases. Again, at Whitewater, we've had some uh, circumstances. For example, a coach that was reportedly fired for calling 911 when an individual was raped. We have material on this that's released in ways that are handled by marketing people instead of the open and honest release of statistics and information, basic information that would. Uh, uh, provide for a future that we all would like to be a part of. So what are the responsibilities of institutions right now, the people in this room, to hold these schools accountable, okay? Accountable uh, for informing people in an honest way of whether or not they should hide uh, while walking down the road. Uh, uh, all of this stuff, again, getting it out of the hands of marketers and PR people and into hands of people who are going to be presenting this stuff honestly. I, and again, I'm right over here, but if you'd like uh, to get uh, more information about what's happening on Whitewater, it's not very pretty picture. Thank you very much. Do you want to take that? Right on, I agree. Um, they often have these marketing people, I'm sorry. Um, I know I've done college tours with both my kids who are now adults in their 20s and 30s, and uh, that's a recent thing where they'll I'll tell you about the crime statistics, and I'm always curious about what's hidden. Yeah, Try to speak. Oh, I get sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, um, first of all, just a few comments about some of the topics that I thought about. Um, I'm one of the tiny group minority that actually read the book Wasted when it first came out many years ago. That's the one that supposedly uh, the first had on. Um, I guess based on uh, my own observations of the social secret in that period, I tend to uh, suspect that a lot of the uh, information in there is more likely true than 
not than about uh, Joe Biden's administration. Um, I find it interesting that the early establishments uh, about him came out on conservative and right wing conspiracy oriented uh, websites and podcasts and blogs. And I'm glad to see now that it's finally going into the mainstream media. Again, because of the photographic copy of the that's available, I tend to think that most of the allegations about him are true. And I'm glad to see that the mainstream media is finally picking that up. Uh, I wanted to go back to the question about uh, health, uh, the healthcare uh, industry the problems there. I'm wondering how much of the problem might be due to the fact that traditionally there's been this uh, power structure within healthcare where the physician is God and everyone else is there just to uh, serve him. And then that fact is further uh, augmented by the fact that physicians are grossly uh, overpaid as well as uh, hospital administrators, certainly to be uh, nurses. How much of the problems do this uh, rigid hierarchy that I believe that way is reinforced by uh, very gross uh, economic uh, differences? And another question, uh, what was the role of the media in the uh, in incident that occurred in Salt Lake City where a police officer actually arrested a nurse because uh, the nurse felt that a uh, police officer was acting inappropriately and other things. And, uh, what should the role of the media be uh, exposing incidents like that? Thanks. The answer is yes, that power and privilege um, of the medical community is reflected in um, the Times Up Me Too movement and what is allowed is being permissible. So that's quick. Um, I don't remember all the exact details of that case. I believe that nurse was a in fact, right, in fact, right? She was protecting a patient um, who was a, 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 who herself was a, crime, a victim of a crime, who was unwilling to have her blood drawn at that time. I believe it was a female, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, she was doing what we do, which is advocate on behalf of our patients, and particularly around forensics. That is not um, forensic nurses, which are called such, uh, Forensic nursing is a specialty, and I don't know that she was a forensic nurse. However, in any time that we care for anyone, uh, they have a right to refuse to have the police come in and uh, take blood or ask a, ask a personal question about a crime. So um, I'm not quite sure what your question was, except for how the media covered it. It certainly got a lot of coverage. Uh, and I'm glad that it did. I'm not sure it's resolved the power issues of nurses being able to stand up and advocate for their patients and families and not be reprimanded at work. We have one more question. Hey, I'm a reporter with Sounds Public Radio, and I've had a hell of a two weeks. Um, last week I reported on two young boys at high school allegedly sexually assaulting a young female in the bathroom. This week it was a young boy allegedly sexually assaulting two females on a school trip. Um, and in all of the reporting that I saw, not a lot of people were focusing on the structure. So they were talked to the school board, uh, but they wouldn't actually hold them accountable for how are you going to change the structure of the schools to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen again. And then also, all of this stuff was happening in high schools, and we weren't hearing from high school students at all. I think that my story was one of the first stories that actually quoted young women at that high school who said, this is how I feel. My administrator said this about the situation, and this is how it makes me feel in my school. And so I guess my question to you is, how do we ensure that as journalists we are looking at these structures of power and privilege and oppression that are making these incidents happen and possible? And also, how are we making sure that we're quoting the right people or talking to the people who actually matter in the story, um, not just checking off a box of, OK, it's a person of color, OK, it's a woman, but who is actually being affected by these, people, these structures? Um, and then you know, attack, address the people who have the power and say, why is this the case? Hire more people like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, I would also ask, and that's absolutely a, a great answer, but um, it, it goes back to something that uh, Eric Swisher said um, during the keynote conversation, that we need to um, 
abandon the episodic stories that just look at yesterday's accusation, yesterday's uh, event, and look at things, as you said, more structurally, and look at it in terms of larger patterns. I mean, the question about healthcare uh, points to power, as Barbara said, that power isn't just um, in the healthcare industry, it's in higher education, and it's in law, and it's in the hotel industry, and it's certainly in Hollywood. Uh, and for all of the success of the stories um, about the Me Too movement, uh, the one thing that we really got very little about was how power is implicated and how power got deployed. It was uh, really just about yesterday's accusations, and sometimes yesterday had 50 accusations uh, uh, and 50 different stories. But we got very little that really looked at the deployment of power and, and very little about dynamics across um, an industry or uh, across uh, an entire culture. So that's also something we really need to do a much better job at. But, Partly because of not having enough people and not having enough resources, not having enough time sometimes, we tend to have a lot of episodic stories rather than these big global thematic stories. Thank you to our panelists.